All right, anyways. So, um, talking about website accessibility and the internet as a whole. This is a quote from Tim Berners-Lee. He's a, a little bit of an important guy. Uh, he created the World Wide Web. Uh, and he says, the power, <laughs> the power of the web is in its universality. Access by everyone, regardless of disability, is an essential aspect. So that's the foundation of the internet and of websites in general. That's why accessibility should be kind of a core aspect of what you're doing when you're creating a website. Be, uh, keep in mind that there's all different types of people that are going to be viewing your site, not just somebody that is completely 100% able-bodied and uses a mouse and a keyboard and can see the screen. So, also, the UN has even gotten in on this game and uh, has defined web accessibility as an essential human right. So the access that people have to the internet, to the information on the internet, is a human right because it's such a, a major part of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, worldwide. So why should you care? Uh, this is a very simple formula, but potential clients plus worldwide users means that there's going to be an equal unprecedented access and equal opportunity to information. This is a, as, as basic as I can explain web accessibility and why it should matter. So, a few quick facts. There's 20 million blind adults in the US, approximately. 10% uh, approximately use screen readers, and 8% of, of men and half a percent of women are colorblind. You might say, all right, well, that's not actually that many people in the grand scheme of things. We're going to get into that, but that is a very important part of there are a lot of people that are using websites that aren't 100% able-bodied. Able so the, the most common example that comes up in terms of web accessibility is colorblindness. So uh, the most common form of colorblindness is deuteronopia. And that's the simplest example that I can provide. So on the left-hand side is the normal color wheel as you would generally see it. And on the right-hand side is what you actually see. So the most common way to describe that is if you're using red, for example, uh, to highlight something. Right? Say you have a sale on your website or for your client's site and you say sale, but there's no other indication of the sale other than the fact that you, you used red letters and an exclamation point, for example, then it's not going to really stand out, right? It's going to be this like, sort of awkwardy brown, green, gross color. Um, but if you decide to use other factors to highlight what you're highlighting, so you use like a circle or like a, a star behind it or something else, anything else that's not just solely dependent on color. So we're going to go through a, a few examples of websites. Uh, this is apple.com, pretty well-known site. Um, and it's also very highly regarded as, as a really well-known, um, they take design into account, right? Uh, they're very well-known of taking design into account. So if you look at it with Deuteronopia, it's not that bad. You can still understand, you can see what's going on. Sure, it's not as warm and uh, you know, welcoming, I guess, because the pink is gone. But at the same time, you can still, it's completely legible. You can read what everything is saying. This is the first step to just things to think about when you're creating your site. The next one, this is a, a government site, whitehouse.gov. So also a fairly prominent site. Um, and if you look at it with Deuteronopia, again, it's not as good as the Apple site because there are dark colors and it's, it does start sort of blending in. But even they've, I mean, it's a government site, so they're kind of responsible for being responsible about this. <laughs> but they, they did do a relatively good job of making sure that it's still legible. Now, this site, you guys may see it, have seen it already, it might be a little familiar. This is WordCamp Atlanta's site for this year. Um, and this year's site does a pretty darn good job. For the most part, it's still legible. The bottom is a little bit harder to read, kind of. But it's just, I, I want to give these examples so you guys have something in your head to look back on when we're talking about all the other stuff. So, colorblindness is not the only kind of disability. There's a very large number of other things. Um, so, these are the, uh, this is a basic breakdown as I've done it. Uh, auditory, cognitive, neurological, physical, and visual. So uh, there's color blindness, of course, but then there's also hard of hearing. So if you have videos on your site, make sure that you have captions for your videos or something else to describe what's going on if somebody can't hear what's going on. Um, or you have levels of blindness. It might not be color blindness, but they, they might be on the scale of legal, all the way from legally blind to just nearsighted or something. You know, they don't have glasses on. Um, 
you also have uh, ADHD or dyslexia or um, if it's a cognitive disability, then making sure that your website is laid out properly. So you want to be sure that it, the layout of the, the site map and everything actually makes sense. It, you know, your about page is where you would think an about page is. Your contact page is where you would think a, a contact page is. I've had clients that, that have had very interesting menu setups and uh, it's not always clear where, why, why a certain page is underneath a certain subheading. Does that make sense? Everyone with me so far? Nodding heads? Cool. Good. Um, and then also there's things like physical disabilities. Uh, it could be something like you can't use a mouse, so you're using a keyboard. Um, or it could, be, it could be a permanent disability and it could be a completely uh, temporary one. For example, I was in a car accident two weeks ago and um, <clears throat> the airbag hit my hand and so my wrist was, it, it burned and tingled and it was not fun. But the, the annoying part of it was is that I work on the computer all day. So my right hand was kind of out of commission for a few days while it, it got better. And I noticed a lot of how much I use the keyboard and the mouse. And I was like, oh, geez, this is not fun. I can't imagine if it was like a, f a permanent thing. I would, might lose my mind. Um, so it's just things like that to keep in mind. Not a, it might not be a permanent disability, but a temporary one. But that might keep someone from staying on your site or um, taking in your content. And then finally, um, things like screen readers or uh, eye tracking or things like that. A lot of people will use screen readers as the facts mentioned earlier. Um, so things to keep in mind when you're creating your site, make sure that the code or the, the alt tags, for example, make sense. Because uh, when, you, when you use a screen reader, it reads everything. So if it doesn't make sense and it's not laid out properly, it'll just sound like a bunch of gobbledygook. Um, I would recommend checking that out on your computer. If you have an Apple, you can use Apple VoiceOver. There's a lot of different programs for Microsoft computers. Try it. You'll see how annoying it is if it's not properly set up. So there's all sorts of different assistive technologies. Screen readers, as I just mentioned. There's also Braille display, text-to-speech, voice browsers, voice recognition, keyboard navigation. These are all different kinds of tools that people will use to, um, to access your site in however they need to access your site. So, screen readers specifically. These are some of the most common screen readers. Um, I would recommend checking out one of them, all of them, any of them, um, because you will get a much better understanding of what I'm talking about just by experiencing it. So, now, what makes a web, we've talked about all of these things, the, all the disabilities. So what makes a website accessible and how can you know that yours is accessible? So there's things like types of content, there's size, complexity, development tools, the environment, who your audience is, all these different things that you should be thinking about. And I, I know that it's a lot, especially if you've never thought about accessibility before, but it's, it's a lot more important to do one thing than do nothing at all and start with baby steps and start thinking about it, even if it seems overwhelming right now that there's so many things, I'm not doing anything right, I'll just not make it accessible at all. Please don't think that. Please just like do at least one step. It's not as hard as it looks, and if you guys have any questions, always you can always ask me now or later. Um, yeah, so I just like saying that throughout because I can see like some eyes glazing and being you know overwhelmed, so. All right, so we're gonna talk about um, content. So. When you're building your site, you have intuitive not if you have intuitive navigation, properly labeled links and images, and you have user-friendly design, then people are going to stay to read your content, right? If your site is properly set up, then they're going to be willing to stay to look at more of your site. If they come to your site and your home page is a mess for whatever reason, they're not going to stay. Still with me? Yeah? Okay. All right, so there's a lot of different strategies that you can think about. So for content, um, you think about the auditory, the visual, um, and the tactile content, like how you're doing it. For example, the videos that I mentioned earlier. If you have videos, think about the sound. Think about not everyone is going, to, even if it's something as simple as, oh, I don't have my headphones and I'm in a coffee shop, so I can't listen, I can't watch your video. I do that all the time, and it's really helpful whenever a video has captioning on it, because then I can at least, like, basically figure out what the video is about even if I can't listen to it, right? Um, also, thinking about your presentation. Uh, the first example with Apple's website, it was whether you had color blindness or not, you could still completely read the website and the content of the website, right? So think about that when you're thinking of a background or images or putting text on top of something. 
make sure that, is, that it is really, really distinguishable. If nothing else, the image can fade away. If the image is not important, but the text is, make sure that the text is distinguishable. If the image is important, then make sure that no matter what, if look at it in black and white, print it out on a piece of paper. I actually don't. That's a waste of trees. But um, <laughs> look at it with uh, look at it with uh, with a black and white view. Like you know, do a printer preview and look at it in black and white. Something, anything, just make sure that it is legible on all, uh, all accounts. Not just thinking of really crazy situations like um, stripes on top of uh, plaid or something. Definitely don't do that. But um, even for simpler ideas like putting red on top of green might be OK sometimes, depending on the kind of red and green that you're using. But if you put like from, um, from the eyes, from the color wheel from before, if you have all, all the colors that are all together, then they're all going to blend together if you have color blindness. Does that make sense? OK. I like that this row is like nodding and going with me. It's very entertaining and very helpful. Thank you, guys. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> um, all right, so evaluation tools. So now you've built your site, and now you want to figure out, all right, I already built it. Now I have to go back and like fix it. What? So these are some different evaluation tools that I would recommend you guys look into. By the way, I have put these slides up. Um, they're on my website, and they're also, I tweeted them out. So right before the talk at about 10.45. So if you guys want the slides, all of the information is online. And all of those are linked. So you can click on it and go to their respective websites to learn more about them. So just as a heads up, if you, don't, if you can't write fast enough or whatever. Um, so they exist. And uh, all right, so implementation. The thing about, yes. Um, it's pretty easy to read online. It's not as great with the, with the um, projector. But it is actually pretty easy to read online. Yeah. Better? Yeah? OK. Sorry, guys. <laughs> My bad. I, 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 can you guys see now better, at least, if nothing else? All right. Yeah, if you, if you follow along on the website or on your computer, it is a lot easier to read, and which is why I put it up. Yeah, so if you look up on Twitter, just at Nancy Thanke, which is my name, um, or if you go to nancythanke.com, it's the latest post. So, T is in Tom, H A N K I. Thank plus an I. Let me know when you guys are good. Yeah. Yep. You guys good? Get in there? Awesome. Yeah. How do the reader enforce the schema? Are they, uh, are they working with schema now? Kind of. It depends on which one you use. Yeah. The, the, there's not really like an easy way to break that one down. I recommend looking into them because looking at different ones will also give you a better idea of how each one reads it. So, all right, next, implementation. So the cool thing about accessibility is that if people start using it or demanding it, more people will start using it and or demanding it, right? So if developers create tools, then people are going to use those tools. If people are using those tools, then they'll, they'll ask site creators to make sure that those tools can be used on the sites. If the site creators get asked to make accessible sites, then they'll, they'll be asking for accessible to, like, tools to make them accessible, right? So you have the nice little circle of life going on. Yeah? OK. So uh, a little bit more in depth is that you have all of these different things. So you have browsers, media players, assistive technologies. They all go into users are going to use them. And then they're going to, like, they're going to go in. And because they're using them, they're going to demand that they be, you, be able to be used. right? And so then developers are going to say, oh, well, now I'm being asked to make these things. So I guess I better start making these things because I have people asking me. right? So you have the nice, it's a little bit more in depth. but a kind of example of why you guys should start using it. Because even if it seems a little hard to do at first, as more and more people start using it, more people will start using it. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK. So there are lots and lots of benefits for others when you make an accessible site. Uh, there's digital divide issues, mobile access, older users' needs, low literacy, low bandwidth, new, inf new or infrequent users. Um, so there's so many reasons why you should think about making an accessible site. People think that, oh, it's just you know, 
well, it's for disabled people, so I don't want to think about that, or I, it's only for this, and I don't want to think about that, and it's not true. Accessible, accessible sites are important for so many reasons. Um, if you have a really, uh, a, a, a site with a lot of content, and it involves a lot of things that need to load, but people don't have a good internet connection, then they're not going to be able to access the content on your site. Right? So you have, um, as more and more people use phones rather than laptops, then you also need to think about um, mobile responsiveness so people can use the sites on their phones, et cetera, et cetera. There's so many different examples. So now we've talked about all the other people and everyone that's going to be using your site. Um, so that's important. But what is, it, what is in it for you guys, the ones that are actually building the site? Um, and does it matter how accessible your content is if nobody ever finds it? So <laughs> I see a lot of shaking heads, which is very true. Um, we're going to go back to that slide from before. The thing about accessible sites is that when you make a site accessible, you're going to make it more intuitive to use because you're going to make the layout better. You're going to make the content more e easily accessible. Um, and you're also going to be using better UX and UI, right? because that's, that is what makes a site accept more accessible. So when you do that, people are going to use, they're going to access your content more, period, right? So that, that's a good thing. You want your site to be well known. If it's a business, you want your business to be well known. If it's a blog, you want your blog to be more well read, you know, things like this. The fact that you make your site accessible is good for other people and it's good for you, okay? You guys still with me? All right, so that example from earlier that I talked about, this is what you see on the left, right? It's, um, it's my hands with Mindy on them. And it, you can either say, all right, well, this is image, you know, underscore 5789, right? Or you could say that this is the image source, which is Mindy.jpg, and then you have an alt tag, a girl's Mindy covered ha hands outstretched. That is a lot more helpful than image underscore 56789, right? And this is also helpful not just because for screen readers, but it's also helpful for search engines. Because search engines don't know what image you are putting on your site. They can't see the image and say, oh, well, this is a girl with Mindy on her hands, obviously. They're going to see a bunch of pixels. That, that's all they know. If they see the alt tag, then they can say, oh, all right, so this is a picture of Mindy, with a girl with Mindy on her hands. And that means that this is, that's what this post is about, or that's what this image is about. And I can categorize this site as this is what it offers, right? So if you, the more and more image tags, alt tags that you use on your images, then the more your, the search engines are going to know that that's what you do. So this is especially important for things like photographers' portfolio sites, because or any artist that uses a lot of images on their site and has a portfolio site for any reason, because most of the content is images. You don't have blog posts, you don't have pages to really describe what you're doing, other than the fact that you know, hey, I'm a photographer, or, hey, I'm a, a painter or whatever, but you probably don't have very many words on your site. And if you use um, any sort of uh, SEO plugin on your site, it'll probably tell you, hey, your post is not long enough. Please use more words. But you might say, well, I'm a, an artist. I don't have any more words. Look at my painting. It's pretty. Um, so in that sense, because you have the alt tags, it tells search engines what you do and what you're about. So. This, I know it's very small. It's purposefully done so because I want you guys to look at the slides, the slideshow later, and go through this. Because there's no way that you can do all of these all at once in one, one speech, right? But these are examples of things that you can do. As I mentioned before, it may be overwhelming for getting your site accessible. You might already have spent so much time on building your site, and now you're being told, hey, make it accessible. And so you might think that it's a lot of stuff to do. Even if you pick just one thing from this list, you will make your site more accessible, and it'll be a good thing. And you don't have to do all you know, 17 things that are on this list all at once. You can go one by one and say, all right, well, I know about this. This I can do. Alt tags. That's a pretty simple thing. It'll take a bit of time, maybe an hour a day or something, and go in and change your alt tags. Or decide that, oh, well, I'm going to make my, um, my menu structure better, more navigable, et cetera. All these different things. So. Um, I will read through them really quickly. If you guys do want to talk about them more, we can come back at the end um, if there's enough time. But providing a clear and proper heading structure and avoiding empty headings. Please do this. Please, please, please do this. Um, providing descriptive link text. So this one's a pretty easy thing to do. Whenever you're making your links, instead of saying, 
uh, go check out this, right? Instead of saying this, say go check out Bob's Burgers website, you know? Instead of just saying this or check out here or anything like that, make a descriptive link so then people know that this is where I'm going to be sent rather than, you know, just being like, oh, I'm going to click on a link. If they happen to be computer savvy and can hover over the link and see the little thing in the top bottom left corner, then they might know the URL. But if not, if you're using a screen reader, for example, then it's just, it's nice. Um, and even if you're just reading the page, it's nice to know. Ensuring page titles are descriptive yet succinct. This is something that a lot of people seem to have trouble with sometimes. Um, and making, just, making the title short, it, it helps if you're just thinking about, well, I want to tweet this title. How can I make it short? That might help. Um, just making sure that like, you make the, the title as short as you can while still obviously describing what the, the blog post is about or page. Um, not relying on JavaScript for things that don't need it. That goes back to internet connectivity issues a lot of times. If they, don't, if they can't load it or for, what, for whatever reason they can't load all of the content, then they can't really access the full awesomeness of your site. Uh, avoiding mouse-dependent interaction. Um, this one is, might be uh, easier said than done, but just trying to make sure that nothing is solely dependent on scrolling, right? Like a parallax, parallax effect or you know, something like that. Uh, using standard web formats when possible, providing transcripts and captions for videos, identifying the language of pages and page content, allowing multiple ways of finding content. Um, so a search map, a, a search bar, a site map, um, a table of contents, some sort of clear navigation of some kind. Uh, providing useful links to related and relevant resources, ensuring URLs are human readable and logical. So try and like make it actual, an, a URL that you can read out loud without using a bunch of numbers and letters, for example. Um, ensure, or presenting a clear and consistent navigation and page structure. I would, cannot emphasize this enough. Please make sure that you're, if you're using categories or tags or you're using parent categories and subcategories, make sure that they make sense, please. <laughs> um, avoiding CSS and other stylistic markup to present content or meaning, um, defining abbreviations and acronyms, and having <clears throat> unique and relevant titles and meta descriptions. So yeah, those are just some things. There's all sorts of other things you can do. These are some of the simplest and easiest things to go through, especially when you're first starting out and trying to make your site accessible. Can you explain that a little bit? Which one? The third one from the bottom, avoid CSS. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, basically, when you're, using, when you're using CSS, right? So if you use CSS, you can, um, you can basically designate that something is different. It looks different, mm -hmm. right? So making sure that you're not just using how it looks, to define, to designate it from the rest of the content. Does that make sense? Well, I could understand that, say, using titles, or mm -hmm. as long as you're using a structure. Mm -hmm. That's one of the main things. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Sorry. Sure. I'm trying to take over your talk. No worries. I'm, I'm, from the, I'm part of the WordPress accessibility team. Mm -hmm. um, so what that means is that, so for instance, if you designate something in your CSS as, OK, so you said, all right. Uh, Click the, the red something okay, for whatever button that that is uh, button or element you know some of the whatever you're making asking them to do. Um, so to not designate that by color alone, what that means is you know um, a better way to handle that might be to say um, click the the product button on the left. Click the or or activate the Read more or the, the I'll repeat it. Oh, sorry. Um, so, can you stand up? Sure. Sorry, I'm totally taking over your talk. No worries. Um, hi, if you don't know me, I'm Amanda Rush from the WordPress Accessibility Team. Um, and basically, what we do is help make WordPress accessible. Um, so, this is what I She's do. a really important person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like to tell myself that. Um, so anyway, <laughs> this is what I do. This is my job, um, and I do this all day long. I build um, accessible websites, accessible applications, and accessible plugins for my clients. So um, what the, what she means by not using um, CSS alone um, and using color alone, essentially, uh, to, to distinguish something like a website is, so for instance, if you have a, um, you're pointing out products, now, I mean, you're pointing out um, a, a particular um, 
image or something that you want for them to click on. So instead of saying just um, oh, click on the red box or whatever to bring up the, the particular product, what, a better way to deal with that is so go ahead and like, by all means use the CSS and style your product links or style your, your image borders or things like that uh, for, for those links. But um, what she also needs is uh, provide some kind of text um, that says click on the or uh, choose the uh, whatever product link. So choose the, the, the link for red shoes um, or something. And then make sure that when you provide that, um, use your CSS. But if there's an image involved, make sure you have an alt attribute, which is a little alt equals something, quote, and then your description of whatever you're providing. And make sure that that same link or button can be activated by a keyboard. So you can totally use your color um, and your CSS, and you can make it look pretty. That's fine. Um, just make sure that you provide an alternative way for somebody who is using a keyboard or who is using a screen reader um, or who is colorblind to find what it is that you're trying to actually get them to get to. Because if they can't find it, and if all you're doing is depending on, on color alone and your CSS alone, they're not going to click on that. And th if you're doing e-commerce or something like that, they're not going to buy your product. Um, and there's a lot of us that spend um, well, I'm spend this on online because um, we don't drive. We're going to shop online, or, you know, things like that. Or we don't have somebody that can take us to the store. So we will gladly buy your products online, but if we cannot find and cannot access what it is that we're looking for on your site, then that's a lost sale. Okay. Um, so, okay, you can talk to Thank you. That was awesome and very, very important. Go ahead. Okay. I haven't seen that, but I'm sure somebody else in this room has because I saw nodding heads. It seems like all of my clients got warnings about the about the CSS. Interesting. Yeah, if you want to talk afterwards, we can talk about that. I haven't seen that. I'm sorry. Um, all right, so finally, resources to consider. Again, I know it's not a legible side, slide. It's purposefully there for you guys to, you can't you know, click on all these links right now. But go check it out. Check out all the different resources that there are. I am just a lone speaker, and I can only point in all the awesome resource directions. Um, but all of these places will have information. They'll either have tools or a breakdown of, it'll, it'll be something as simple as, hey, this is what accessibility is, all the way to something as technical as, this is how you need to change your code to become more accessible. Um, this talk is specifically supposed to be like an introductory, like, hey, this is what accessibility is, and it's not as crazy or hard as you may think it is. Um, but check out these sites, because I hope that this at least interested you enough to see more about what you can do and that it's not as hard as you may think it is. And finally, I would like to leave you with this final thought. Uh, look at it this way. So you're not, you are not the only person that cares about your blog about bunny rabbits, or you're not the only person that cares about your store that's selling uh, jewelry, for example, right? So make sure that like, you're, because you're not the only person, there's so many other people that are going to be accessing your site. Whether it is someone that can't drive, for example, they're going to be looking at your e-commerce store. And if you can provide a really good experience, then they're going to buy from you because you're the one that actually cares about their, um, their business because that's what you are. You're a business. You should care about your users and your customers. Um, and so just think about the fact that there's so much more than just you who is accessing the site. Um, so finally. Um, and this is basically, you, you are basically creating what is this, and you're just you're turning it into this. And that is what you're doing to your site when you're not making it accessible. Um, this beautiful image is now covered up, and no one is going to enjoy it. So homework for you guys. <laughs> I'm going to be checking on all of you. <laughs> um, just a bit of homework. Check out some sites that you go to on a regular basis. Open up a screen reader and look at the, and listen, not look, listen to the screen reader read the site out to you. Is it legible? Do you still like going to that site? Because odds are you probably won't. <laughs>
So, so just keep that in mind when you're making your own sites, whether it's for yourself or for your clients. Or just you know, talking to a random person that says, oh, you make WordPress sites, what do you do? Just tell them about accessible sites because you'll be cool. Um, <laughs> But just think about that and try screen readers. And don't try just one, try different ones because they all have different um, features about them. So just check it out. If you have any questions, I will be here and I'll also be there. Um, and yeah, that's it. Oh. So the basic idea of digital divide is the basic idea of digital divide is that you have um, you have different levels of experience of people with digital technology, right? So you have people that are you know you have two year old toddlers that can totally set up your iPad and they're totally good to go, and then you might have people that have never really used technology as much or they they don't you know. For example, I taught my mom how to use a mouse a few years ago. Like she didn't use computers before because she didn't use a mouse. And so like the idea of teaching even a mouse is a very interesting concept. It's very like intuitive to us now, but it's weird teaching it. So basically keeping that in mind that there are people that will know, oh, I can right click and do things with this site and do stuff. Or there's people that might have no idea how to access your site in terms of if there are fancier, quote unquote, fancier things that are on your site and ways to interact. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Exactly. So in terms of accessibility, when I, I should have explained this earlier, the ter uh, when I talk about accessibility, it's not just for um, keeping, in, keeping disabilities in mind. That is really important, but it's also keeping in mind that it's accessibility for all users, right? It's like the, the quote at the very beginning. It's to keep in mind the fact that there are people that may only be looking at your site on a mobile phone. They may only have a really slow inter internet connection. They may not really use technology that much. They may um, not really know how to read as well. They may not know how to hear. Like there's, there's so many different ways that people interact with technology. And to keep that in mind when you're creating a site. If you're creating a site for like a local florist, for example, you may not be as worried about accessibility, maybe. You still should be, but people will argue about that. But if you're making a site, like say you're, you're making a blog, for example, about um, running, right? You might think, oh, well, I'm running, so I don't need to make it accessible. Only people that run are going to want to look at my site. That's not necessarily true, first of all. Second of all, even if you're not thinking about disabilities, you should at least be thinking about other things if people are accessing your site on their phone or they don't have a good internet connection, et cetera, et cetera. There's so many other things to think about other than just disabilities. That's the one like key takeaway I would really like you guys to take away from this, is that accessible sites is not just for people with disabilities. It is very much important to make sure that you keep those in mind but it is also to make sure that it's, it's accessible for all people, period. Yeah. I haven't heard much in the last five years about the legality of requiring accessibility. Can you speak about that a little bit? There's kind of a legality. It depends on where you are. For example, um, the European Union is a lot more strict about making sure that sites are accessible. Um, I've even gotten tickets from users in the EU that have said, hey, like you need to make, I need to make the site more accessible. How can Jetpack do it? Kind of questions. Uh, America is not as on top of that game. <laughs> um, I, it's not, it's not a legal requirement to make all sites accessible. There is a, a growing trend of government sites have to be accessible, um, and because of that, a lot more companies are requiring their sites to be accessible when they're made. So you may be dealing with clients that are requesting accessible sites. Oh, or you may just have clients that are interested in, hey, what, can, what else can I do to make my site better? And then at that point, you can introduce the idea of accessibility. But there is no like blanket accessibility legalness about it. Um, yeah. Oh. 
Yeah, there is. There, there's a lot of conversation happening, but nothing no, officially draft. signed. There is, a, there is a standard draft in the DOJ. Um, oh, okay. Came out, uh, nice. Last week. Um, ah. It was last week. So, and they're looking at actually releasing those guidelines in 2018 um, for the for for websites in the U.S. So there is some some legislative stuff going on, but there is the right now the court decisions are mixed on. Um, specifically with when, when people have been sued over their website. Um, the courts have split on those decisions, but the DOJ is actually um, drafting guidelines and they released the first draft of that, I think, uh, of the latest draft uh, last, this past week, I think. Did you guys hear that? No. no. So there's a, a the DOJ has done has released the latest draft on what, on the guidelines, but they haven't it hasn't been fully passed by courts yet. Because courts are divided. Okay. Uh, Nancy, a big, great job. Thank you. Thanks. Um, one question I have is about we try to use this text, uh, you know, like uh, you've seen a lot of uh, Joomla sites that the bigger text, small text, to increase or magnify the text font. Uh huh. Uh, there's some plugin we used in our site trying to make it accessible. Okay. Sure. But it kind of conflicts with other plugins and that kind of made it very hard to right. make it work. Um, I don't have suggestions on what other plugins you could use because unfortunately there are often plugin conflicts whenever you use a site because you, you do have to balance between how do I make the site the, the text legible while also keeping your design intact because the bigger the font gets obviously things start shifting around if, especially if you have responsive design. Um, something to keep in mind is that people do end up magnifying their screens on the browsers. So it's more important that the content is organized properly than it is, like, it should be big enough. It shouldn't be, like, size 10 font on your, on your uh, browser, right? When you create your site, please don't make it size 10 font. That doesn't mean that it needs to be size 40 font. It just needs to be a, a legible size that, makes, that covers the largest population number, right? And then, I know that I'm sounding like I'm contradicting myself. You should make your site accessible. There does come a point where other technologies come into play. For example, I had a classmate in high school that was legally blind. She uh, had, you know, much larger, uh, she could see, but she was still legally blind. So she had much larger textbooks, for example. Um, but then on, she had her own personal computer that magnified the entire screen. And so she was able, it wasn't just, you know, clicking command plus, 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 plus. It was actually a magnified screen on, on, on the whole. So there's, there are things like that that other people are using that you can also keep in mind. But I would definitely defer to the person in the front row who is blind well, more than me. We still need the answer on what, what can we do to, if you need to provide the text magnifier? Uh, because that is a requirement in certain uh, scenarios that we work with. Mm -hmm. But uh, we have a hard time doing that in WordPress environment compared to your life. There's a plugin called um, WP Accessibility by Joe Dolson on the uh, WordPress plugin repository that does provide, um, it does have the, I think, does it have the, the magnification thing in it? Uh, no, it actually doesn't because according to the, the WCAG 2.0 guidelines, um, what needs to be, what actually needs to be provided is, um, so users need to be able, they need to be able to modify, not that the site itself needs to provide that modification functionality. So as long as you have not blocked, say, Zoom um, it, on your mobile uh, responsiveness, then you've covered that guideline. Um, as long as you are allowing for a user to either be able to do Command Plus or Control Plus on Windows, or um, use their magnification software, um, then you've covered that guideline, um, and that's included for uh, Section 508 as well, which is the government the purchasing standard for the United States that has uh, guidelines as well for what websites you're supposed to include. So the website itself doesn't necessarily need to include that functionality, but you just need to not block it. Right, so in other words, don't stop somebody from being able to magnify their site, but you, but you don't necessarily need to include the technology itself on the website to, to magnify. Does that make sense? That makes sense to me. Did you guys hear it? Yeah? Okay, cool. Whoever raised their hand first.
I don't know that there's a talk about a class that's in, in play right now, but I do know that, like for example, at WordCamp US that happened in December, there was a very large accessibility meetup to try and make sure that the content that we have, the documentation and everything about making sites more accessible actually exists and is robust enough to help with, with that side of things. But would you know, Amanda, if, um, um, if there's, there's a class in? So there's nothing, like there's not a team effort um, in the WordPress space for a class just because we've got to figure out, okay, so if we do this, then, you know, okay, um, how do we make it free? You know, do we make it free and then charge? We, you know, so there are people in the, in the space, in the WordPress space that do um, accessibility stuff. Uh, you know, and, and we are, you know, basically accessibility consultants, but um, that I don't think that idea has actually been floated. And I'll, you know, what I will, if nothing else, then I'll float it on my own personal Twitter and go, hey, so whoever's interested in like a WCAG for developers, um, or WCAG for for content managers, or, or whichever, um, you know, but there's not an official joint WordPress effort to teach WCAG because, or 508. Um, partly because 508 is about to be modified, um, at least that's what the government's telling us at this point, that there is like an actual date for when we're going to release the standard. Um, and partly because there are, um, the W3C itself, the World Wide Web Consortium, does have a lot of documentation on, so you know, here are the WCAG guidelines, and here's about 400 or so pages on how to understand and how to apply those guidelines to um, actual web Content. But there's not there's not a, a joint WP accessibility effort to say we're going to get together and develop a course just for the WordPress community and say um, you know we're going to teach you guys. But I don't know. Like I might actually float that on my own Twitter and, and see what the interest looks like. And if the, if there is enough interest in it um, to make it something that that would would be viable, just because it would take a lot of time um, to do to put A to put together and B to actually run. Um, if there's enough interest, then yeah, I'll, I mean, I'd be willing to do it, but um, um, at this point, there's not like an actual, there's not an accessibility team effort to say we're going to teach you WCAG from the ground up. Cool. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like, is this correct in saying there's different degrees of accessibility? Like you don't have to do everything at once, but here's everything you could do. Um, so what does someone say you need an accessible is it like you're like black or white reader? I don't, I don't see it as black and white. I think that you can make your site more accessible. I say this because there isn't a legal requirement that says you have to do X, Y, Z things to be an accessible site. Uh, the EU has those kinds of requirements. You're either accessible or you're not. I guess once you are accessible, you can technically become more accessible, but there are certain, there are certain points, check boxes that you have to check off to become an accessible site. So there isn't that. When I, when I have the checklist of things that you can do, these are things that you can do. Um, if you do one of them, then cool, you're on your way. If you do all you know, 17 of them that are on the list, then great, you're going to be really accessible. I, it would be great if everyone in this room went and did all the things that are listed. And those aren't the only things. There are many things. There's a 400-page uh, guideline or rule book, not rule book, a book of all these things that you need to do. That's also in that list of resources. It's linked. Uh, it's a lot of stuff, and it can be very overwhelming. So if you already have your sites ready, I don't recommend sitting down and reading it all at once because you, will, you might want to like chuck your computer. Um, so just start off one by one. Try these different things. Some of them are really simple. Some of them are not as simple. I, I won't just like stand up here and say, oh yeah, it's really easy to make your site accessible. It's not necessarily really easy, but that doesn't mean that it's not worth it. So, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you guys. You guys have been an awesome audience.